celebrating 45 years in 2020, the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland continues to uphold their mission of enriching the lives of the diverse LGBTQ community through advocacy, support, education, and celebration in Northeast Ohio. After more than 19 years in the Gordon Square Arcade, they outgrew their storefront space in June of 2019 and moved into a brand new 15,000 square foot building in the heart of Gordon Square Arts District. Navigating a brand new building and global pandemic, the center expanded their free to low cost services to individuals of all ages through grocery deliveries, a business incubator, arts and culture programming, the Metro Health Pride Clinic, and more. Each year, the center brings visibility and awareness not only to Detroit Shoreway, but to the city of Cleveland through their nationally recognized events, including their annual Pride in the CLE March and Festival, Trans in the CLE Conference, and LGBT Heritage Day Awards. I sat down for a conversation with Executive Director Phyllis Seven Harris for an inside look. Thank you for joining us for an inside look, a conversation with Phyllis Seven Harris. I'm Lauren R. Welch, and we're filming safely at a distance um, to adhere to the stay at home guidelines that were put in place um, during the COVID 19 pandemic. Today, I'm joined by Executive Director of the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland, Phyllis Seven Harris, for an up-close and in-depth conversation around the work of the center. Phyllis's tenure as the first African-American lesbian executive director in the center's 45-year history, how the work of the center has shaped the LGBT community in Northeast Ohio and around the nation, especially during a year of racial uprising and global pandemic, and what she believes the future of the center looks like. Join me in welcoming Phyllis Seven Harris. Thank you for so much for taking the time out for this conversation. Thank you. It's um, quite, quite my pleasure to be able to have my voice heard and to be interviewed by you. And so I'm really excited. Um, you know, you came on, you know, right as things were going wild at the center and hit the ground running. And uh, we haven't I mean, we got to know each other's communication style and work, and um, you've done a great job lifting me up and lifting the center and our work up over the last year. So this is a great way to celebrate your one-year anniversary um, with being at the center by being interviewed So I, by you. So, so, so thank you for um, allowing me to do this. You know, before my time working at the center, I mean, I was following your work. I was following the center's work. You know, and I, I imagine like other people, you know, like me, I, I was seeing the the move to the 15,000 square foot building, the awards, the accolades. I mean, you were getting Cleveland Magazine's Power 100, Most Interesting People. I mean, very highly sought after, you know, awards that you rightfully earned through your activism and leadership. Um, and I think not a lot of people, I mean, I had no idea you know, what goes on behind the scenes um, and the extent in which you actively fight uh, to protect the lives and safety of so many people on the margins in Northeast Ohio and around the nation through your board leadership nationally. Walk me through a little bit um, through your journey that kind of led you to the center. The center. Wow. Yeah, it's a story that I love to tell. And, you know, as the years go by, it gets more and more embellished. But the core facts are still here. <clears throat> you know, I was, um, you know, uh, newly uh, sort of like figuring out who, who I am, who I was at the time as a woman, as a, as a, I'm someone who is um, in, uh, I would say early, early to mid career uh, moves in the nonprofit sector. And I took a hit, I took a hit around um, the economic downturn in 2008, 2000, by 2009, I am 44 years old, 43, 44 years old. I'd worked full time for myself, full time since I was 17 years old, you know, really making it on my own with the support of lots of people who created access for me, but really doing it on my own. Um, and I don't have a job suddenly. I don't have a job, not because I didn't do my job well, but because I didn't understand the politics of the organization, I didn't understand the economy. <clears throat> and at the same time, I have a personal um, blow up in my life around my relationship. My long-term partner and I split. So 2009 is a crappy year. And I am trying to keep myself together, um, 
and uh, move forward. And I um, love nonprofit work and I believe in it and I needed to be around other nonprofit uh, practitioners, people who are working in the sector. And so I joined boards and I joined, um, I got the opportunity through my work at Planned Parenthood to join the board of community shares. And I thought it was cool because I'd never been on a board where you could give money away or anywhere <laughs> in the position of giving money to people. Not that it was our money, but we, you know, um, as a community benefit organization, I thought that was cool. And then I joined the board of um, Spaces Gallery because I'm one of those people who, I'm not an artist, but I love to be around creatives. Um, and so, and as a nonprofit um, practitioner, I'd only work for health and human services organizations, the AIDS Task Force of Greater Cleveland, the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center, Big Brothers Big Sisters, you know, like great organizations. Um, but I'd never worked for a, um, a um, arts organization that was a nonprofit. I'd even worked for a nonprofit that was an affiliate of a national organization. So I understood organizations that had autonomy and organizations that follow policies and standards set by the national organization. So I was like, oh, this is just gonna be me broadening my experience. So I joined Spaces and it also helped me to be around people who are nonprofit managers and directors and program coordinators and, and things like that. And so I got asked to join the board of the center and I said, no, because um, the truth was I didn't have any more money. <laughs> I, I had very little money. And, um, and then they ask again, and then they ask again, and I said, yes. Um, and so um, at my first board meeting, there was an opportunity for us to uh, vote on po posting a position for a part-time ED. And I was with my peers and said, well, why would we ever do that <laughs> for a job that is as big as this? And so long story short, um, on my way home, I decided that I would um, reach out to the then board chair and ask them what they thought if I were to submit my name as a candidate for the full-time position. And I went through a grueling process of probably three or four interviews, um, <laughs> which now when I look back on, I, when I see those, some of those people, some of those questions, I'm just like, whatever, <laughs> um, being a little bit petty. But um, what I saw was people who were very serious about this position and this role and this organization. And I was just like, huh, okay. So let's put my best foot forward. I got the job um, and um, I started, I went to work. Yeah. And Go ahead. I'm so sorry. The idea was that, you know, really I would say I want to be here four years. If in three years I can't turn this around, I'd be having a conversation with the leadership saying um, it's not my my leadership style that will get us here. We should be looking at someone else. Um, I was also personally had moved to Larchmere and my kids got my my kids started going to the high school. I needed stability and I needed a job. Um, so it's also an opportunity for me to come back as a, as a nonprofit practitioner, um, to, as somebody who worked in many nonprofit organizations to show um, what I knew. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, could you have imagined going into this role what you what you would have expected or have there been moments that have kind of shaped since you've been here, how you led or how you lead? Yeah. I had no idea. Um, I, and it, you would think I wouldn't be as naive this time around after, you know, um, you know, some experiences I had before. Like I, I learned to, you know, you know, find out about um, nonprofit organizations. I love teaching it now because, you know, um, what's happening really behind the scene? Who holds the power? What are the finances like? You know, how are the staff treated? You know, what's the organizational culture like? You know, do they have partnerships? Um, all of those things. Um, and so, you know, I didn't know. I, you know, I saw opportunity. I saw that people um, saw the position as one that was um, coveted. You know, even in when I was, you know, I'm looking at the salary and I'm looking at the, you um, the resources afforded to to the person who is going to be in a leadership position there, and there are very few. Um, but I also saw 
you know, uh, a board of directors that existed who wanted the, the centers to survive and, you know, had a vision for it, its survival. Um, and uh, my job became um, supporting them in both that vision, but saying in order to get there, there's some other things that are gonna need to happen. And so um, I didn't know exactly what I was getting into, but once I got there, I knew what it needed. Yeah, I mean, for those who don't know, the center just two years ago was across from the current building and what many considered the basement um, in a small storefront. Um, walk us through what it was like before the current uh, building and how we got into the beautiful 15,000 square foot space that's now um, across the street in Gordon Square. I mean, you were the first executive director to receive a, a gift of this magnitude, correct? Yes, yeah. I believe so. A huge gift. Here's the thing, you know, uh, you know, I love telling the story of the center of the past um, because we made magic in that basement. Um, I remember as a community member who was an, also an East Sider, um, well, when the, the center moved to the location at 6600 Detroit Avenue. And, you know, it's hard because we were East, I'm an East Sider and it's, go, it's on the West side. Um, but the pride that I felt when I went to go visit and I saw the walls gaily painted and, you know, and felt the energy of the building. Um, and so it was a big deal. And, and I think great work happened there. Um, I will tell you though, that when I got there in 2012, what I described it as that the staff who were, who remained were what I described. And I have no really business making reference to this, but it, um, what I consider like shell shock, you know, they were in the basement. Um, the doors were locked most often. There was a lock on the refrigerator. There was a lock on the, the cabinets. Um, you had to have appointments on certain days. Um, I remember the first team meeting I went to, I called it a team meeting and I, you know, like they were just like, whatever. And I would take cookies and they were like, whatever, <laughs> you know? And so it was really hard because they had been through some things and sort of like uh, we're coming back on the upswing with an opportunity around some funding. There had been, um, you know, a couple different um, EDs who, you know, gave it their, their best try. You know, I don't understand, you know, why we as uh, folks who work in the nonprofit sector accept that, you know, somehow people think we deserve less or that, um, you know, we are, we are very crafty. We're very innovative. We get things done. We get people served. We get, you know, people supported. We, we do care about um, the donations that we're getting and we do great things and that did happen at the center, but um, it was really sort of like, um, you know, a couple programs kind of like straggling along. Um, there were some cultural norms um, around those programs, but there weren't, there weren't the, you know, the, the type of um, structure that would um, be, um, would, would garner any more support or investment. Um, they weren't really telling their story. There, there was an e-newsletter. So this is me really, you know, tr not trying to say, you know, it was all terrible and, you know, like, um, but certainly, you know, the, there was benign neglect and you can see it everywhere. You could see it on the walls. You could see it in the, in the practices. You could see it from the attitudes of the local community um, members and organizations in terms of how they um, engage with the center or chose not to. And so it was very interesting. And, um, you know, there were still people who cared about the center, who sent their um, their monthly donations, who sent their annual gifts, who, you know, who... I mean, like the the city, and I and I say this honestly. You know, if you are a Clevelander, you know, uh, be proud that you know Greater Cleveland has been able to sustain and maintain an LGBT center. And in the life of a nonprofit, there are times when things are rough, and things were rough, and they were looking toward an upswing um, because of a of a bequest that they received in in 2011, the center. But it was. Um, it was, we're the comeback kids and um, we don't get called that often. Um, I don't know why, you know, I feel like the turnaround woman, you know, like I don't want to do it again. You know, it's, it's very hard. Um, 
But certainly um, that first round of meetings that I had with foundation program officers where, you know, I'm like, I'm here, I'm queer, you know, they were like, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> and, uh, and they were super honest. And we, um, you know, we be I began to ask really tough questions and um, make changes and talk, talk about infrastructure. And um, it wasn't easy, but changes occurred. And, and it, it, well, yeah, what I did was applied what I learned about, you know, how nonprofits operate and, and pointed out the, the gaps that I saw and tried to fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. And um, thankfully, because we do have this new building, um, do you feel like there has been a greater impact on the LGBT plus community? I mean, in, in, in Northeast Ohio, I mean, there's we just acquired the Metro Health Pride Clinic that's now in the center. I mean, expanded services. I mean, what do you think that that impact has been like in your in your eyes um, yeah. transition? I really see that the, uh, an, L an LGBT community center that is um, supportive of Greater Cleveland. Um, so if you are interested in working in Cleveland and you are straight but more progressive and are used to engaging in queer um, things and you're are seeing people <laughs> um, um, who don't I who are not straight or um, if you certainly are, you know, LGBTQ, um, you know, uh, things, the, one of the first things you're going to do, whether or not you ever set foot in the center, which I think is interesting, is see if there's an LGBT center. Um, and even those who now say things like, well, you don't really serve those of us in the middle. I am, you know, the, the millennial to boomer folks who have a complaint, uh, not boomer, the um, Gen Xers who have this complaint. I'm just like, come on. Anytime you all um, are, are needing a therapist, when you are, sometimes when you break up, if you need to go to an AA meeting, if you need to, you know, you use the center. There's not like the pro a program specifically that you're showing up and, you know, there's, you know, lifting weights or, I don't know, but you know, I'm pushing back on that. I'm and I'm, I'm I'm sort of over it. Um, but I do think that you know, like what what it has done is, um, like, what well, like we say, we we've established ourselves as an anchor organization in the boards for arts district, but we are an asset for Cleveland, and and we see ourselves as such, and we want to be able to partner and live up to that, live into that role. We were not, um, you know. I think that there's always been um, acknowledgement in some ways. Um, we don't want to forget Heritage Day and the fact that there were local leaders who made that happen um, for the city of Cleveland. But um, I do believe that, you know, the center, when I when I got to the center, we weren't involved with the gay games and I didn't understand why. <laughs> it was just like, well, why aren't we where the center? Um, I didn't understand that pride was not a program or was not operated by the center. Oh, and you know, why is my table way back here? <laughs> We're in the center, you know, like, so mm -hmm. I just being honest, it was, <laughs> it was like, um, it was really uh, an opportunity to really grow and, and, um, you know, build on the legacy of the folks who had a lot of pride and courage and do something. And, you know, the opportunity was there for a major gift and we were ready for it and it was hard to be ready for it. Um, so it took a lot of folks um, stepping up in leadership roles, including myself. I'm not leaving myself out from that. I know the role that I that I took or and continue to take, but um, certainly to be ready for it because sometimes opportunity comes and you're just not ready for it, so you miss it. And we didn't do that. Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, I'm glad you touched on that a bit because, um, you know, the center has been this hub in, in greater Cleveland. I mean, I don't think people will understand. I mean, we're talking about there are places where you people are going into New York and going into L.A. and you they're they're Googling it. I'm glad you point that out, because when you come here you're, you're seeing the LGBT community center and um, you know, it's a lot of managing expectations. I'm sure, you know, as a nonprofit practitioner, 
you know, people expect the ocean and you're like, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, you know? Yeah. And so speaking of expectations, you know, you not only acquired this building, but just what, five years ago, acquired Cleveland's Pride Festival in celebration. Um, and now that it's coined as Pride in the CLE, uh, which I want to know is attracting more than 10,000 people downtown every year. Um, you know, do you believe that transition for Cleveland Pride prepared you for these moments of transition? I mean, tell me a little bit about the experience of what Pride in the CLE, for those who don't know, um, is all about. Yeah, so I think it was um, one of the first times when I think about um, when I realized uh, that there was a calling to lead, if you will, you know, um, and that if I led, people would would listen. Uh, that I could I could influence folks, that I can get people to gather. And that was when, um, you know, there was this announcement that Pride wasn't going to happen. I can tell you, I remember where I was standing. Um, I remember um, what I said immediately afterwards and, and asking for a face-to-face -face meeting. And that was on a Tuesday. Um, I brought in um, <laughs> Ryan Clapton Zimler, who is now my... Um, um, also a business partner, but um, I brought him in and I said, I need somebody else in the room with me because, <laughs> you know, details, you know, like I need somebody listening to the details because this is what I'm hearing and I'm having this re response to it. And we went in and we heard and I said, okay. Um, I said, we're going to need to let other folks know, other LGBT leaders in the city know. So I want to convene a meeting so that this can happen. And um, I sent, I think I sent an email and almost everyone showed up. I think maybe one, one group maybe didn't show up or whatever. And I thought, whoa, uh, that was cool. They care about this. I care about this. It was okay that I felt sick to my stomach when I heard it. I'm not weird. You know, this is something that we care about. And um, we got together and, and really have been continuing to try to work on a model where we are remembering the history, um, where we see it as a privilege to be able to produce it for, you know, greater Cleveland, um, where we um, think about and think through how to be more inclusive, um, where we, you know, really decenter some of the, um, the the party circuit party aspects of pride we don't hate it um uh, we just needed to to get back to the center see <laughs> the education the activism yeah the speak out stage um you know and so we think that we've come up with a model where we can as pride in the cle can be those things and our partners can also be the things that we love about our culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really finding a niche um, around being in, in, in um, remembering our history um, that we march, that pride started as a protest, that um, it takes all of us. Um, um, we have families, we have um, um, trans siblings, we have elders, we have people who are differently abled, we have, you know, we have young people who need different su supports um, and we all need to be seen at this day where we're um, both um, remembering our roots and then also celebrating who we are. And so it's not easy. Um, we don't get it. It's not perfect, but we're doing a great job with it. I really, I really. Um, think that. Yeah, it's great. And, you know, I That's think. Well, I'm sorry. Could repeat that. I said, I, you know, I really think that people are responding favorably. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, that kind of leads me to 2020. You know, 2020 came along. And I think uh, one of the first thoughts uh, when uh, the news of the shutdown order came from Governor Mike DeWine, you know, surfaced, we kind of all sat back and were like, pride, what are we going to, what are we going to do for pride? I mean, what was going through your head uh, when the shutdown order happened? 
Uh, you know what? What was interesting is the internet stalled on your question. What? I heard what 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 was going through my head. What was going through your head when uh, the shutdown orders from Governor DeWine happened? That's what I thought. I heard. <clears throat> well, that's it. I, you know, all I can keep thinking about is seeing Gomer's face. <laughs> my coworker, our coworker, and, um, and um, thinking, yes, she was right. And um, listening to our partners at Metro Health who were shutting down. And um, I'm like, just on the news, you know, talking with Daniel, how are we going to do this? How are we going to message this? Um, we're shutting it down. We need to be safe. We're at risk. You know, I just kept thinking about the LGBTQ community, um, and you know, hearing the word the word like pandemic and you know and stuff like that, and um, I just wanted to make sure everybody was safe. So what was going through my mind is, who do I need to listen to? Who's right here? Who's what are they saying? Um, how do we keep people safe? So the first thing was, you know, the message that we were closing things down and then to get the, the, the teams safely home. You know, like we're in this situation where, um, again, you know, people are scrambling and like wondering what's going on and we're in positions of leadership. Um, and so we begin to, we begin to move. Yeah. I can, yeah. I, you know, I feel the energy of it <laughs> right now. Yeah, I think everybody was kind of uncertain um, what's next, you know. Um, you know, I know a lot of nonprofit organizations, including ours, you know, in business, uh, you know, were wondering what, what was going to be next. What are we going to, you know, expect? And many of the nonprofit and businesses faced tremendous financial hardships. And many of those hardships led to layoffs and a, a disinvestment from many of their core services to stay afloat. Um, in 2020, the center managed to keep all of their staff and programming while providing new services in the community, like the rainbow closet that just got started that provides clothing for free um, and shoes to those who need it most, artist talks. Um, can you share as a nonprofit practitioner what went behind some of the decision-making there and how you stayed ahead of the curve in the midst of a global pandemic? Yeah. Well, you know, I think having an asset helps. <laughs> we had a building um, to protect and we have a building that shelters and we, you know, and I think, um, I, you know, we had just moved into this building um, and, you know, um, we're, 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 we're still learning and still are learning how to manage the building um, so we went from protecting the people and, you know, including our staff and, um, ensuring that we were continuing programming and really, you know, taking on what we felt like the, some of the, the spirit of act up, you know, not all of it, but some of it like, yeah, we, we gotta be seen, we gotta be heard to really advocating for, um, keeping this building, um, operating in some in some shape or form and it really takes people um and so so um we we did that so what what we did was we 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 we'd gotten to the place because of our experience of moving from you know um sort of looking at our finances and understanding it to um, razor eagle eye sharp you know on what was coming up and, and, and what we had the potential to do, the energy, the um, momentum, the visibility, the credibility, and then the staff. I had just staffed up with some amazing um, new positions that I knew I needed earlier in the year. I got, a, I got it in at the end of the year in 2019, your position, marketing and communications, so that we could message uh, a director of development so that we could um, change our um, year-end appeal to pivot toward COVID appeal, um, 
I knew that our donor database had been cleaned up. Um, I'm talking about an organization that I stepped into where I didn't have donor records. I keep telling people that when they're mad at me because they got a form letter or, you know, like I, you know, I barely had anything to work with. We got it back and it took forever. Um, but we did. And, um, you know, that position around um, development associate really helped because it began to allow for full time focus on cleaning up our donor database and, and getting things together. So I had all of that in place. Um, I believe that because that those positions, um, you fight me if you want to. <laughs> but I believe because those positions were in place that last quarter of 2019, when we were hit with what needed to happen for in response to coronavirus um, and all of the um, sort of like unknown, you know, <laughs> um, challenges that existed because I, we had the right people um, in the right positions to be able to pivot in the right amount of time. Um, it didn't necessarily mean that you know, it hasn't been hard. Um, you know, our our board just before that had really, you know, said to us, we need to really look at how much money it's, it really costs to operate. And, you know, it is, it, it was hard to know. It was a new 15,000 square foot building that we were completely responsible for. We don't have any debt with the building, but Still, our burn rate was is pretty high, and so looking for efficiencies um, and you know understanding how that works uh, is challenging for us. And so what we did is we called in experts. You know, like we have the type of credibility now that if we say, "Hey, we we need some expertise around this because this is what we're facing," uh, so we were able to do that. And we were just getting to work, you know, when we got the notice of the shutdown. Um, but because we had those positions in place, we were able to, I believe, pivot in a way that has um, allowed us to stay afloat, at least um, it did for 2020. And we're just looking at working hard. Um, you know, in, in 2021, we, we have something, you know, worth it to work for. Uh, we haven't been in our new space consecutive uh, for 12 consecutive months, um, but we are operating to the best of our ability, and we appreciate you know all of the support that we've gotten you know up until now because it's been incredible. People care about us. Absolutely, you know, and I would be remiss, you know, I hear you say you know some things you just had to fight for. I would be remiss not to mention that in the midst of a global pandemic, we were also in racial uprising. Um, and, you know, Cleveland was just named at the beginning of 2020, one of the worst places for Black women in the nation. Yeah. And here you are, a Black feminist lesbian leading a nonprofit with a history of being led by white individuals. You know, has any of that been a factor in your time during the center and how you've led and advocated? I mean, and I hate, I hesitate to say has, because we all know that Black women face many societal and institutional uh, setbacks regularly, but I am curious to know how you tackled those challenges while also advocating for everyone else. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a constant reminding people that I'm more than just an executive director of an LGBT center. I am that, and I'm proudly that. Um, you know, um, I'm you know I'm black. You know, <laughs> I'm a woman. You know, I'm a feminist, and I've always let folks know that I'm an activist, and I've let folks know that. You know, um, and so all of the things that people are reading about and hearing about and challenges that black women face, I faced in this role. Um, um, you know, it, it is, this is not a, you know, you know, everybody is being called in on this. When you look at uh, the nonprofit sector, it, and, it, and that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean the center too. Um, and so, you know, I've dealt with all sorts of things, you know, um, um, some I've managed and dealt with well, and some not so well, you know, I can remember, you know, community members you know, getting close to me in my face and saying, the center needs programs, <laughs> you know, like, I'll, I'll never forget it, you know, like, and, and I thought, you know, <laughs> I'm, am I going to make it, you know, <laughs> am I going to make it, but I think it's, it was worth, it was, 
you know, uh, it was worth the reservation now to be able to speak out openly about uh, racism within the LGBTQ community. So I think of the silver lining, you know, I, you know, like if, if I, I want George Floyd's and all those uh, before him who were unjustly murdered to see that, it, you know, that we're not just sitting around going back to the way it was, um, you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't see not calling out my oppressors. You know, I, I know I gotta, I gotta continue to work. We have to continue to work as a country. It is divided. We, you know, it's, it, you know, I will tell you, it's all propaganda. You have to decide which side you want to be on. I want to be on the side of helping people. My side of history. <laughs> okay. So like, you know, jump on where you need to jump on. Um, yes, racism exists within the LGBTQ community. I've experienced implicit bias. I've experienced um, um, just straight up, you know, um, you know, sexism. I, I've experienced um, shutting that down and having people understand, you know, what is happening and that they're um, promoting the very thing that they think that they're against, you know, like, um, so there is some, some teaching that happens there. Um, so yeah, you know, like I think it it adds to the story of the center in in terms of our resilience, and it adds to the story of queer people, queer people in Cleveland, and where we find leaders, where we find and follow, uh, and where we choose not to. There is a story to be told for those who continue to invest and who who have um, stood up and stood with and stood down, yeah. and those who have not. Well, and, you know, I'm glad you mentioned, um, you know, all of this ties into the center in a very good way, because it's interesting when we were coming into this uprising, you know, um, there were so many of our uh, allies who were kind of like, I don't know what to do. And I'm unsure what, the, you know, kind of coming to terms with not just their own individual behaviors, but even how they've been leading, you know, their own institutions. And I, you know. I commend you and the work of the center because it was kind of like, you know, that saying, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. And right. we kind of had infrastructure already in place. We had, you know, people talk about anti-racism and, and, and anti-LGBTQ. I mean, we had trainings, we had programming, we had, you know, when we're talking about supporting Black trans lives, you know, we had we have programming in place that supports that activism. Um, you know, what have you been seeing as a nonprofit practitioner when you're out and about? Um, do you sense a shift? Um, do you sense a shift, you know, in Cleveland? What what has that looked like from your end? Because, you know, a lot of us as staff members, we're kind of, you know, we're in it and, and we're doing the work. But it is interesting to see it from your peers and C-suite. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious about that. Yeah, it's it's been very interesting. Um, again. You know, I started getting those phone calls from, you know, I tell people I got phone calls from family members, friends and colleagues, you know, white people saying, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, what can I do? Um, we are really um, addressing this here. Um, and I was on the side of, OK, let me tell you <laughs> what you did and what you can do. And um, and here is, you know, here's 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 an incident. You know, and, and, you know, you might not be seeing it as this. This is my opportunity to tell you, here's how it felt. Here's how it landed. This is what you do. This is common. Um, and here's an example of how you do anti-racism work, it's specifically in support of Black people. Um, this, this person um, did this. You know, I tie it back to um, the work, uh, the, the center, you know, so um, there was, uh, you know, I didn't do this on my own, right? So there is someone who said, um, I want to do something for the center. And I say, that would be cool. But let me tell you, if you just do that, it wouldn't be a good investment. You're going to have to do this too. And they believe me and they support it the supporting the infrastructure. But what they also did was supported me in my leadership. Yeah. Because I think um, had I not had the experience of what it's like to be a nonprofit manager and understanding how nonprofits operate 
and what is needed for sustainability, um, I believe we would have had a building. But I don't believe that we would have had a building that we could create a sustainable model for. Yeah. And so I think, um, I think, you know, in addition to being able to give great examples of, you know, how people uh, participated in, in implicit bias around all sorts of things when it came to me, my class status, you know, my race, my gender, um, all of that within the, um, my work in the LGBTQ community, there's also someone um, who is white <laughs> who is saying, we're going to support you in your leadership. We're going to make sure that you have the money um, that you will need for your annual donation um, for to be on this national board where I can learn from other leaders across the nation about how they're managing their LGBT centers, mm -hmm. where I could build relationships and therefore build power, yeah. build credibility, have resources, you know? And so I think um, it has been um, incredible to be this conscious, um, to have this type of opportunity, to be able to call in not call out, I'm changing, you know, the dichotomy around that for myself, but to call in individuals around um, what my experience as a black woman, as a black lesbian feminist mom has been in this leadership role. Uh, and so taking this opportunity after the murder of George Floyd, after the murder of Tamira Rice, after the murder of, you know, like, Yes. And say, here's how I'm going to be now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's how I'm going to use my voice. Um, here's what I have to say. I don't care if you believe me. Yeah. I know you have the power. I'm having my say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, things you're most proud of this year in 2020 from the center. Whew. My oh, team. Done this year. <laughs> My team. I'm most proud of my team. I mean, I mean, like people think that we're just like being um, egomaniacs, I think. But when I tell them that we took one week, we, we, we did that shutdown notice. Remember the conversation on Zoom? And we all came up with, we all had something to say about what we were going to get done. And we had one week and we were going to reconvene. And when we came back in that week, we were ready to rock and roll. We were, we were, so my, you know, we were so serious about, you know, um, you know, taking care of the community, like um, of giving back, you know. Um, and so and then I've just watched it over and over again, you know, in the month, subsequent months, you know, people are not calling on us, checking in on us saying, how are you doing? <laughs> you know, really, they are and they're not. So they, I think they are in their donations. Maybe I should take that back, you know, um, because people are. are can have continued to support us by giving and all the campaigns that we, we have. It's not easy, you know, we never have enough. Um, but certainly um, we are just expected to be on the front lines and we are. And so I guess I'm most proud of my team that they are exceeding the expectations that I would have for them um, to be doing this work during uh, a racial um, anti-black racial uprising, I don't even know what to call it, and a global pandemic. Yeah. So super proud of my team. I'm like, I, I can't I can't say it enough. Um I I I, I love working with them, um, with all of you. Um, you know, you know, we have we're we're human beings, you know, like you know, we have good days, bad days, you know, but mostly we have great days. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I I would go on a limb and speak for it. I think we're all grateful for your leadership also. <laughs> we're grateful as well. Um, do you have any final thoughts around what the future of the center looks like for you? Um, you know, going into 2021 and beyond. I mean, you're coming up on 10 years in the next couple of years. I mean. Yeah. What? So April will be my ninth year. Yeah. And um you know, I mean, I thought, you know, I thought 2020 would be different. And, um, 
you know, 2021, I think, is a recovery year for the center in terms of um, really being able to refocus after COVID. Uh, we learned a lot. We learned that, that we can reach more people through virtual programming. We learned that we can uh, uh, produce an amazing uh, pride experience for our community, both virtually and through a new event that we, um, you know, launched, you know, this year with the Pride Ride. Um, we, we learned that, you know, um, we do have some voice and influence. And so we want to um, focus uh, our energy around, um, you know, the the quality of life for trans people in Greater Cleveland. So we'll be doing that work. Um, we, you know, have stepped out in being one of the, the first LGBT centers that has a school. And so we're so really excited. And I hope people are paying attention to the partnerships that we're making, you know, first with the Metro Pride Clinic, um, with Signature Health, Health with um, now CMSD with the School of One. Um, so we'll, we're, we're you know, gonna be maintaining and recruiting for those. Our core programs you know, are, are still in full effect. Um, we do, we will be announcing some hour changes around, changes around our open hours, um, just really facing the reality of COVID and, um, a uh, not wanting to to um, to cut back on our our actual core programming in terms of delivery, but we will have to try to figure out how to save some money and um, and see how things go. So um, more to come on that. Um, we're still working, um, working really hard. I'm super excited about um, new board leadership. We. We had, you know, a cohort of board members who stayed on uh, four years or more. Um, those um, individuals, you know, have finished their their terms and are rolling off. And so we have worked really hard over the last several months, staff um, and board included, to bring on new board leadership. Um, and so can't wait till you hear the announcement of these folks and. Um, and, and interested um, during this recovery year, what we'll, we're able to also accomplish. And so really sort of like maintaining, retracting some of the, our open hours, um, still focus on delivering program delivery and um, looking for a new, new leadership in, in, in 2021. Well, I think that that is a great place to end on. Um, there's so many highlights that we have coming up for the center. And if you want to support the center, be sure to visit lgbtcleveland.org to make a donation or find out about our programs and services and ways to volunteer. You can also follow the center on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and on LinkedIn on, with the handle at lgbtcleveland.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing from you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.